Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the talk at Cylon Apache Arrow based data frame. I'm Supun Kamargami and I work at Indiana University Bloomington. Um, Cylon implements an in memory data frame that can work across uh, thousands of uh, CPU cores to speed up your data processing applications. We started the project at the end of uh, 2019 and we are a growing community. Um, I'm an uh, Apache Software Foundation member and I'm uh, working as a software engineer leading the uh, silent project at uh, Indiana University. If you are interested in, uh, check out my book, Foundations of Data Intensive Applications, uh, which is uh, scheduled to be released in September. Um, you can uh, pre order it now on Amazon. Some of the uh, things I talk about here are discussed in length in the book. Um, here's an outline of the talk. Um, first, we will uh, do a simple demonstration of data frames and then go into details about why we need data systems that work closer to the hardware. Then we will go into details about silent architecture and look at one more example that works at a scale and then see some performance results. So let's um, get started. Um, first, let's uh, define what, what is a data frame. In our view, a data frame is another name for a table and operators around it. We don't believe in using data frames to represent vectors or matrices. If we need a vector or matrix, matrix, there are libraries that are spe specifically designed for that. This separation will keep the implementation clean and not muddy the field with unnecessary complications and performance issues. Some notable uh, uh, libraries for vectors and matrices are BLAS and NumPy. Um, data frames go way back as they started with the S programming language R introduced the concept to the mainstream in 2000. And Pandas followed its footsteps uh, in 2009. Now data frames are a familiar concept to every data scientist and engineer. Um, before going into the details, uh, let's quickly look at a simple silent example so people unfamiliar with data frames can get an idea of what it is. Um, in this example, we load two CSV files and concatenate them while removing duplicates. Uh, on the right uh, hand side, you can see these uh, examples of these two data frames. Um, so they, they, they are like uh, tables, but in a CSV format. Um, the operation that we are looking uh, into is equivalent to a union operation in relation on algebra. Um, uh, people who are familiar with uh, Pandas data frame will see that our syntax is similar. I think it is by design. Cyan tries to keep that similarity as much as possible when implementing its APIs. Now let's look at uh, why we need uh, uh, data processing system that work uh, closer to the hardware. <coughs> um, Data science workflows start with the data in data stores. Um, they can be raw data or close to raw data. Um, we create uh, structured data sets from these uh, uh, data sets, um, uh, maybe using extract, transform, and load uh, systems such as uh, Hadoop or Spark. So once we uh, this uh, structured data 
we store them again in databases of files. Um, for our data science applications, we use, we use this extract, structured data. Once we have the data in the structured storage, we can start uh, creating our hypotheses uh, for our machine learning and deep learning applications. So the data is queried and transformed to fit uh, the inputs of the machine learning or deep learning algorithms. Most probably these algorithms uh, may uh, need uh, data in vector or matrix, matrix format. So we are going from a raw data that is unstructured, structured data, which may be in um, a tabular format, and then we are going to um, matrix or vector format. So we train our models, we look at our outputs and validate them and repeatedly change our hypothesis and parameters until we get uh, satisfactory models. So this is a complex uh, process, uh, which involves uh, humans and uh, need a lot of different systems to work together. So it involves uh, different uh, systems, languages, hardware platforms, storages, uh, visualization tools. The actual machine learning or deep learning part may be very small compared to the overall data engineering environment surrounding it. Um, this picture shows exactly that point and it is taken from the paper Hidden Technical Depth in Machine Learning Systems. Uh, uh, this paper was uh, uh, from Google. It correctly identifies the complex uh, nature of data science workflows and the rich uh, software stack around these uh, to make everything work. So if you look at to the tools available today to make this work, they come from two separate ecosystems. On one side, there are enterprise data management and data processing tools around the Java language. On the other side, there are machine learning, deep learning, visualization, and statistics frameworks around Python language. I mean, we, re we rarely see researchers use Flink, Spark, or Hadoop for doing serious work at the research application level. On the other hand, Python and deep learning frameworks are thriving in HPC clusters inside national labs and universities. I think this is because uh, these Python frameworks are using high performance C++ code underneath the user-friendly APIs. Um, this allows them to provide the adequate uh, performance required in these uh, demanding use cases. Um, to become part of the machine learning, deep learning world, big data frameworks uh, provide uh, Python APIs, but uh, Java and uh, Python are not natively compatible. Um, so these integrations uh, need to jump through hoops, such as spawning Python and Java process separately and establishing some form of, some form of communication between them to run together. Um, if you look at, on the other hand, um, Python and C++, they can integrate very nicely together natively with minimal performance overheads. And um, C++ and Java also natively integrate with J9 interface as well. So now, if you look at uh, modern data science uh, data centers, um, they are increasingly becoming more diverse with a mixture of GPUs, CPUs, different storage capabilities and different networking hardware. Um, for example, most supercomputers deployed in the national labs and universities have GPUs to facilitate deep learning workloads now. Um, 
they run fast analytics that uh, that transfer data uh, well beyond 100 uh, gigabits per second. For example, the latest uh, supercomputer at our university has 672 compute nodes, each with uh, two, 256 gigabytes of memory. And they have two, each node uh, have, uh, has uh, two CPUs, uh, each with uh, 64 cores. And, uh, and it, it, has, it is going to add additional 64 nodes and that has four GPUs in each, each machine, each node. So 10, 15 years ago, we see uh, dramatic increases in uh, performance of CPUs according to the Moore's law. But nowadays we don't see these dramatic improvements in the performance of CPUs. And we only see incremental small improvements in uh, CPU performance. <clears throat> uh, because of that, uh, most people are looking at custom hardware solutions that can scale their workloads. On the other hand, uh, C, um, CPUs are more and more CPU cores are added each year to a single chip, increasing their performance. Now 64, now 64 core CPUs are available with uh, 128 threads, and soon there will be 128 core CPUs as well. Um, we see increasingly more memory in machines, and uh, 256 gigabyte to 512 gigabyte machines are not common. And these machines are not uh, very expensive as well. Uh, check, uh, technologies like Intel Optane are further increasing the available memory for applications. Today, the standard network uh, speed for new clusters is either 25 gigabits per second or 40 gigabits per second. Uh, 15 years ago, this, this was uh, maybe one gigabits per second. The speeds have increased uh, significantly and cost have come down significantly as well. Also, it is becoming cheaper and cheaper to use uh, fast storage systems such as NVMe compared to mechanical hard disk. Um, so in order to get the full advantage of this hardware, I think uh, we no, can no longer rely on Java language, at least for critical parts. So no single system will be able to meet all these demands. So if I am implementing a data science uh, workflow today, uh, I would like it to be productive, flexible, without um, compromising performance. So I think uh, we, we can all agree that languages such as Python and R are extremely popular because of their ease of use among data scientists. Um, so I would like to use these uh, languages without compromising performance, but using the latest hardware to the full, to the uh, by taking the full advantage of them. So I think we have passed the Java era for these systems, and we are moving towards an era where we implement uh, critical systems in uh, system level languages such as uh, C, C++. So these uh, requirements uh, lead to the development of uh, Silent. Silent is a fast, scalable, distributed memory parallel runtime with the pandas-like data frame. It is uh, implemented on top of several um, fundamental relational algebra operations. Uh, so we use a table abstraction to represent the data, uh, the data in the in the memory. So 
the cooperations along with the data manipulations and data structures all happen in uh, our C++ code. Uh, we provide thin wrapper, provide thin wrappers in Python to the operations. So the in-memory table is kept using the Apache Arrow format. In fact, uh, I think uh, we use the Arrow code to manipulate some of the in-memory table code. Sign source code is with the Apache license version two and it is available uh, in GitHub. So I think this picture shows the vision that we had when we created this project. Uh, so it is about accelerating data processing using small libraries. Yeah, so the, what this picture shows is not a silent centric view in this, since we are at the center of everything, it shows that we can use a small accelerator library like Scylla to speed up data operations in both uh, Python space and Java space. So we use Apache Arrow. Uh, Apache Arrow is a columnar in-memory uh, data spe specification for storage table data. So it is important to know that Apache Arrow is a specification of the memory layout of a table. Um, but uh, Apache Arrow provides an implementation as well. So it is a perfect uh, format for us and what we are trying to do uh, because uh, it is supported by many frameworks and makes the integration with other frameworks easy. So we are, so for example, we can convert um, data between uh, different formats. We can, uh, um, we can uh, work with different systems when uh, we use the arrow form. So we can directly use the uh, arrow structures internally used to integrate with other systems of in the format. Um, Silent has a, so now let's uh, look at um, the Silent architecture. Silent has a communication layer that transfers uh, messages when run at scale. For now, we support uh, UCX and MPI based communications. Um, UCX is a communication library that can transfer messages between nodes using different networking hardware. MPI is also used as a communication library. Um, it has a set of local operators and distributed operators. Also, it provides data loaders for some common formats. Because it uh, uses arrow format, you can easily convert data between pandas, numpy, uh, without much overhead. On top of this, it provides uh, C++ and Python interfaces. Java interface is something we are working on, and R is a future API. Um, now let's uh, look at why Silent is different from other data frame uh, abstractions. First, it provides both the uh, local and global operations. This allows it to work at a micro level and micro level in a large scale environment. For example, if you want to load a large amount of data into hundreds of processes and apply a single operation to all of this data, you can do that using a distributed operation. If you want to do something that is only relevant to a data in a single process, process you can do that too with the local operation. I think you will find that uh, this is a very flexible model when developing large scale applications that are complex. It is backed by a C++ code and we are planning to expand its support to different hard, uh, hardware. So that is uh, another difference between these systems. Also like in Spark or DAS, its execution is not coupled to a distributed scheduler. So if you have just n parallel processes, you can do data processing between them using Silent as a library. 
For example, in a deep learning training application, you can use Scilin along with it. For example, uh, we use um, Scilin to Scilin along with PyTorch to train uh, to train uh, deep learning models um, in the distributed setting. Um, Scilin does the um, data processing part while PyTorch is doing the uh, deep learning training part. So you cannot uh, do that with any other, any of the other frameworks because they need their own schedulers that come with the uh, process management. Okay, now let's look at some uh, silent operators. So this uh, table shows a few base operators in silent. Um, they include things like join, set operations, group by, aggregate and uh, uh, sort operations. At the moment, we support about 40 data frame operators and we are hoping to add more in the future. Um, so Silen uh, supports building, you can compile Silen on Linux, Mac OS or Windows. Uh, we added the Mac OS and Windows support uh, recently. Um, um, so if you if you are looking to get a, quickly get a, get a feel of Silent, you can use uh, the Docker image. We also provide Conda packages for Linux at the moment, and we are planning to expand them to Mac OS and Windows. Um, now let let us see um, how Silent can work at its scale. For example, let us say we have two. Um, sets of file we want to join. They can be in a distributed storage like S3 or ADFS. In this case, uh, we, need, we have F files and S files. Uh, in Cylon, uh, our model is to run the same script in parallel to process the data. So for example, we can write a Cylon script and ask the system to run any instances of of it. At runtime, these n instances can read the files in parallel and process the data. So how do they distinguish from distinguish between these, how, how, do, how, how can they distinguish each other? So the, the processes are assigned a unique number starting from zero so that uh, they know which uh, portion of the data to read. In this example, we have four files and four parallel processes. So the zero process read the first file and so on. So now once the, they all read the data, they can apply a global, global operation like join that works on all the data loaded in multiple processes. So it may seem a little counterintuitive at first, but once you get hang of it, I think you will understand the power of it and will not want to do things in any other way because of it, of the flexibility. I um, mean, if you have some, if you have done programs in Spark or DAS, in my personal opinion, it is the other way around. You will feel it is easy at first, but when you want to do something complex, you will find it very difficult. So now, uh, here is the program implemented in Scilab. First, uh, uh, we create a distributed environment. And uh, this uh, distributed environment has a property called RAN. That is the unique number assigned to the process at runtime. We use that to read the correct file. Then we do, we do, we do that join operation passing the distributed environment. So when we pass this uh, in, uh, distributed environment, the join knows that it is a global operation that involves all the parallel process. So it does network communication underneath with all the other processes to do the join across data loaded in all the processes. Um, so here is how we can uh, 
uh, run the above script in parallel. Here we use MPI to run four processes of the same script in parallel. So MPI run is the one that starts the four processes and then NP4 uh, is where we, we say run four instances of the uh, uh, script in parallel. So now let us uh, look at a few performance results. So this graph shows the power of the silent approach when compared to Spark. Um, this experiment was done on 10 nodes, each with uh, 48 cores. Uh, these uh, machines have 256 gigabit gigabytes of memory. Uh, we ran 200 parallel process, uh, pro processes in Cylon for this experiment. And then for Spark, we ran 200 executors. Uh, each uh, parallel processor executor is bounded to a uh, single CPU core. And uh, this cluster had uh, um, uh, 40 gigabits per second InfiniBand network and a 10 gigabits per second uh, Ethernet. So the experiment was conducted by changing the number of uh, uh, um, rows in the table. Um, so we started with uh, two tables. We, we have in this experiment, we have two tables. And the first experiment, we each table, each uh, table had um, 200 million rows. So we had all together 400 million uh, uh, rows distributed in 200 workers. And uh, in the last experiment, uh, each table had uh, 10 billion uh, rows distributed in uh, 200 workers. So altogether we had 20 billion uh, rows. So you can see uh, with infinite band, 40 gigabits a second, silent could uh, 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 do the join within uh, 27 seconds while the spark took 955 seconds to do the join. So spark was running with the ethernet network. So when we, when we ran uh, silent uh, with the ethernet network for the uh, 10 billion uh, uh, table case, um, uh, we could run, we could, silent could run uh, within uh, 73 seconds. So, so here you can see Spark starts to struggle at large num larger number of rows. So, uh, so when so when we are dealing with uh, twenty billion rows uh, total, Spark is like more than ten times lower than Silent. This is I think this is primarily because of the limitations of Java as more objects means uh, more G garbage collections. Also at this level, Spark cannot keep things in memory and needs to use external storage. Siren can comfortably work with the available memory because it uses this compact uh, um, format to keep, uh, keep things in memory. Also Siren can utilize, so compared to Spark, Siren could utilize the InfiniBand network and achieve the best performance possible in this cost. <laughs> um, so this is another test we did uh, just to make sure there are no overheads between the language bindings. Uh, so this experiment shows that uh, we didn't have much overheads between the C++ PySilent and Java-based implementations. So talking about the roadmap, we are working to further improve our operators by adding more. Also, we are developing the TPCXBB benchmark to fully understand the silent performance. Uh, we are finalizing the UCX integration for communication, which will allow us to run everywhere. And also we are working to integrate with the GPUs um, by incorporating 
the project uh, CODIA with Xylem. Um, so in summary, uh, we presented Xylem, which is an in-memory distributed data frame built on top of Arrow for data processing. Uh, we saw some promising results. And if you are interested, contact me for more application-oriented results as well. Um, we are a growing community and would love your feedback to improve the project. And if you are interested in to uh, get more insights about the project, here are some research papers that we published around the project. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me through Twitter or LinkedIn. And thank you for listening.